and said, you're going to do a headliner. <laughs> I said, uh, who, me? And so Joan and I reviewed some things I might cover. And then uh, a couple of days later, I get an uh, email from Judy Tesno. I need the title of your talk. I said, title? I didn't know there were titles. Headliner, that's the title. And she said, no, 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 we need a title. So I thought about it. And uh, I thought, uh, what I did is, uh, as many of you recognized, I borrowed the title of John Henry Newman's famous book, uh, Apology for My Life. And he wrote it on the occasion of defending himself against vicious attacks in the British press for having converted from the Anglican Church to Catholicism. I want to reassure you that I haven't converted uh, to any particular religious persuasion. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to concentrate on uh, several uh, separate, but uh, as I hope you'll see, connected topics. I'm going to talk about how did I get into ethics in the first place. And it, this is a good example of the old adage, life is what happens when you're making other plans. Uh, I'm going to talk about the time I spent with the National Commission, which was really formative for me. I'm going to talk about my relationship to the Primer organization, equally formative. I'll say a bit about my involvement in writing international guidelines for research involving human subjects. I'll say just a bit about my friendship with Jay Katz, and then close with some uh, contributions I uh, made to uh, pop culture. Uh, first, how did I get into ethics? Well, I did my internship and residency here in Boston at a hospital that used to be called Peter Bent Brigham Hospital. It was in uh, internal medicine, and I thought I would have a career doing mainline uh, internal medicine with some research. I left here to go to the NIH, and there I learned how to do what was then called clinical pharmacology, but my specialty was primarily doing in vitro work, uh, studying the enzymes that make neurotransmitters. Uh, then I moved to Yale, and now begin, oh, while I was at NIH, I was appointed to the committee, I forget what its name was, but it was the forerunner of the IRB. And our charge was to review any research that was going to be done on the normal volunteers, mm -hmm and also any research that involved uh, substantial departures from the mainstream of clinical practice. I mean substantial departures, not just changing the dose of a drug or something like that. And so uh, then I moved to Yale, and after I was there for about a year and a half, I wrote a letter to the dean of the medical school saying uh, this Clinical Investigation Committee has a set of rules that are absolutely impossible to follow. And I've discovered that because I'm trying to write a grant, and there's no way I can write what I really want to do and uh, be in harmony with the rules of this Clinical Investigation Committee. The dean responded by appointing me to membership on the committee. <laughs> that was a typical way to uh, silence the uh, critics in those days. And uh, about a year and a half later, the man who was chair of the committee left to go to another institution, and I uh, was appointed chair of the committee. Uh, it was for a term of two years. Uh, during this time, I wrote a letter, another letter to the dean. And I said, you know, service on this committee takes so much time and energy that we should only uh, appoint people who already have tenure, uh, because they're not scrambling to uh, uh, make themselves uh, sustainable. They're not scrambling to keep alive. Uh, they've got some assurance of continuing employment. Uh, when my two-year term as chair was up, uh, 
I said, thank you very much. I will now rotate out of the chair. And the dean wrote back and said, uh, you said only tenured people should be on the committee. I want you to name one tenured faculty member who is now on the committee, who is uh, capable of chairing the committee. And there I was, uh, hoist with my own petard. <laughs> this began a career of 31 years as chair of the uh, IRB at Yale. Uh, like I said, uh, life is what happens to you while you're making other plans. In the 1970s, I was uh, appointed editor of the journal Clinical Research, something Alex has already remarked on. Uh, at the time, this journal published only presidential addresses and abstracts of papers to be presented at meetings. And what I negotiated is the authority to recruit papers that had to do with what in, the 19, in 1970 I called the social, political, and economic ecology of clinical research. Within a couple of years, almost all the papers I recruited were in the field of ethics of research involving human subjects. And the authors I had for these papers were the most distinguished people in the field. And by the time I got hooked up with the National Commission, the chair of the commission, Ken Ryan, was referring to my little journal as the Journal of Medical Ethics. Uh, and this is something I felt quite good about. Now, in the 1970s, I used this editorial position as a bully pulpit. I complained about things. And the thing I most commonly complained about was the federal government beginning to propose regulations uh, to protect the rights and welfare of human research subjects. And my critique said that these are really half-baked proposals. They uh, are grounded in ethics, so they say, but it doesn't look like any ethics I can recognize. And uh, in 1973, I was asked to write a position paper on behalf of my organization the American Federation for Clinical Research, which incidentally was the largest uh, organization of clinical researchers in the world. And uh, the uh, position paper was a critique of these regulations and how they would be destructive to the research involving human subjects. Well, when the next round of proposed regulations came out, I was asked to do this again. And I had multiple co-signatories uh, from other organizations, and uh, quite a large number of them, actually. And so when they formed the National Commission, uh, there was a, a repeat in my story. It's like writing that letter to the dean. They asked me to join the staff of this National Commission. <laughs> and I said, no, I'm not going to join your staff. As I understand the law, if I am employed by the federal government, I'm not allowed to criticize it. <laughs> And they said, uh, well, OK. And they came back two weeks later with an offer to make me a special consultant to the National Commission, uh, paying 95% of my salary. And they said, in the other 5% of your time, you can criticize us if you think we did anything wrong. And I actually uh, did that. Uh, the report on research involving prisoners was an embarrassment. And I wrote uh, uh, an article saying that the commission had confused the agenda of prison reform with protection of the prisoners as research subjects. And then Louis Lasagna, uh, one of our great uh, board members for so many years, even was appointed to the board before me. I think he was appointed to the board about the time Joe Byrne was. Is that right? Yeah, you and he were co-founders, among others. And so uh, I, I did use that 5% of my time. Uh, so I went to my dean, and I said, they've offered me this job in Washington, 95% of my time to do this. And the dean said, take it. He said, you'd be much more valuable to us there than you are here. <laughs> 
I said, thank you ever so much for your expression of appreciation of my teaching. So I took it. Now, I'm going to turn on some slides now. You wouldn't believe the names of the papers they asked me to write. Each, uh, these are the titles of the papers, and each of these are uh, sentences, or incomplete sentences, really phrases, taken out of the Act of Congress that laid out the charge to the National Commission. The boundaries between biomedical or behavioral research and the accepted and routine practice of medicine or behavioral therapy. I left off the last few words. The role of assessment, of, I mean, you can read these for yourself. These are pretty highfalutin titles, and not even I wouldn't have dared select such titles for my own writings. Appropriate guidelines for the selection of subjects. I truncated the name, the Institutional Review Board, Relevance of Ethical Principles for Research to Health Services and similarities and differences between biomedical and behavioral research. And there were some others. They gave me the assignment to produce one of these papers on the first of every other month. So I had two months to write each of these papers. That was hard for me to do. Uh, this is before we had uh, even word processors. If I wanted to change something, in a 100-page typed uh, typescript, I had to ask my secretary to revise and make it fit in and uh, find ways to do this. And one every two months was uh, uh, quite an effort. I made some considerable mistakes. I was repetitive, et cetera, but I got the job done. They didn't fire me. Let me say a word about, uh, well, more than one word, a few words about uh, some of the content of these papers. The Boundaries paper is the origin of the definitions of research and practice that are in the uh, federal regulations to this day. They're controversial. At first, when I wrote these definitions, I accepted the concepts that are uh, in the Declaration of Helsinki where they equated unproven therapy with research. Uh, I didn't get to correct this until I wrote my fourth paper, The Guidelines for Selection of Subjects. And it was only then that I recognized that the uh, construct of the Declaration of Helsinki painted us into multiple corners, that there were uh, passages in Helsinki that were notoriously counterproductive and that you couldn't follow one of them without violating another. Now, I, the Congress had charged the commission to consider the boundaries between research and practice. And in my paper, I said, there are no boundaries. It's like they're two separate sets of activities. It's like asking to define the boundary between North Dakota and Kansas. The issue is that there was a category of activity that I call non-validated research, but most other people preferred the term innovative. I said it's not innovative, it's not newness that's the defining attribute, it's the fact that nobody has ever proven whether or not this therapy works. And so I said, this is an area of practice the justification for the modalities that are we call non-validated practice are quite similar to what the justification is for medical practice. You do this in the words of the pediatric or the children, subpart D. You, these are procedures that hold out the prospect of direct benefit. Hold out the prospect. You don't yet know if they're really holding out as much of a prospect as you wish they did. But this is vastly different from justifying research procedures in terms of what the benefit will be to the collective, to the general population. And that I consider one of my uh, most important accomplishments. Uh, my original definition said Research is a class of activities uh, that are 
conducted with the intent of blah, blah, blah. This got me into a terrific argument with one Joe Brady, uh, who became a dear friend but a ferocious arguer. And in fact, uh, in order to make sure that uh, what his problem was is that he was a radical behaviorist. And radical behaviorism does not acknowledge the existence of anything you can't see and measure. He said you can't see an intention. And the term he wanted instead was research as a class of activities designed to uh, uh, contribute to the development of knowledge. All right, we had this argument. He brought in a reinforcement, uh, a very fine gentleman named Israel Goldiamond, who is a radical behaviorist from Chicago. He brought in a guy from Chicago to do combat with me. And I yielded. <laughs> and when you, and you know, the regulations say research is designed to do something. But I think most people read, well, that's what we intend to do. <laughs> you can't write a design unless you have an intention to do something. So we're living happily ever after. Uh, the term generalizable has come under some assault recently, uh, not the least in uh, the early draft of the uh, Premer Boundaries paper. Uh, why is the term generalizable in there? Well, the original draft of the definition said that research is uh, a class of activities designed to develop new knowledge. And I said, that's what medical practice is. You do a history. You do laboratory exams. You're developing new knowledge. But the difference is that this new knowledge is intended, if you will, to contribute to the well-being of a patient. It's not designed to or intended <laughs> to contribute to knowledge that the world can use. And so the term generalizable was introduced to distinguish what healthcare practitioners do as they do their histories and laboratory evaluations and physical examination from the knowledge that researchers develop so that they can publish it uh, hoping that they have contributed to the formation of general principles, standards, and so on. Now, as I wrote this paper, I examined the legislative history of the National Commission. And it was full of what the Congress uh, considered examples of evil research. I've called it nefarious research. But all the examples in this, with the exception of Tuskegee, were in fact either malpractice or non-validated practices. The problem with, uh, for example, diethylstilbestrol to prevent miscarriage is not that it was research. The problem was that no research had ever been done to see whether or not this stuff was safe and effective. The sterilization of the research, or REL sisters was not research. It was uh, uh, what many, many people, myself included, uh, considered a, a practice that had known results. You sterilize people with mental retardation so that you will, they will not give birth to new people with mental retardation. That's what that was all about. Thalidomide was a disaster. The problem was that they handed thalidomide out as free samples to the docs, and they said, tell us what you think about it. How does it work on your patients? And it wasn't research. And if it was done as research, instead of having thousands of babies born with focamelia, we might have had a couple of dozen. Sad, if you produce a couple of dozen, certainly it would uh, elicit a headline in the Boston Globe but it's a lot better than 10,000. Risk-benefit paper. The first thing I did is I said, you know, risk-benefit is a dysmorphic uh, construction. Uh, I was asked to define dysmorphic, and I said malformed. But I looked it up in several authoritative dictionaries, 
and the word wasn't in there, but I'm going to stick with it anyway. Uh, I said, risk is a statement of probability. Benefit is something you can see. Even Joe Brady would recognize it. <laughs> and what you're really uh, balancing is harms and benefits. That struck me as a fairly trivial contribution, but uh, many other people thought that was a big deal. I also said that there's a tendency to look at risks, or harms if you will, in terms of their magnitude. If something can kill you, that is a harm of infinite magnitude. If it disables you, you're somewhere, I said, you got to consider the probability. Anesthesia can cause death in one in a hundred thousand cases. Uh, that's serious, but it's not as bad as something that can cause uh, peripheral neuropathy in one in a hundred cases. One in a million, you know, you might just ignore. So you could find the terms considering probability and magnitude in the definition of uh, uh, harms in the federal regulations. I also took step pains to correct the vision of research as being something that was very dangerous. The early writers on research were heavily influenced by the legacy of the Nazi experiments of Tuskegee, of the thalidomide non-research disaster. And I pointed out, you know, in the vast majority of research, there is no injury and very little possibility. The classic research at the time was to put somebody in a metabolic research unit and ask them to urinate in a bottle instead of in the toilet and to eat a constant diet and to do things like that. I even talked to Hans Jonas, who wrote that classical paper, Philosophical Reflections on Experimentation with Human Beings. And Hans said, he used the language of conscription of subjects to sacrifice themselves in the service of the collective. This is the language that was being used at that time in the debate over whether uh, selective service uh, should be continued. Uh, Hans saw it as quite analogous to uh, conscripting young men to join the army and go off to foreign lands to be shot or maimed in order to defend American values. And Hans then changed his perspective and became one of the initial editors uh, or members of the editorial board of the IRB journal. Minimal risk, I oppose vehemently the definition, the whole idea. I always resisted stipulated definitions for terms that are in common usage. They said, can you do better? And I said, yes. And I introduced a concept called mere inconvenience. You never heard of it. There's a good reason you never heard of it. It wasn't any good. But if you look very carefully, you will find in the regulations on research involving prisoners, uh, when something presents mere inconvenience, it's permissible. And nobody knows what it means, and I wish it could be erased. But you know how, how efficient we are at changing faulty regulations. Now, uh, in my paper on risk and benefit, I emphasized that the IRB should get a very good and complete uh, statement of what the risks were. I said, don't worry about the benefits. The researchers are going to tell you more about benefits than you really want to know. This and most of the benefits they tell you about will never be realized. This does not mean they're dishonest, as some would say. It's just that you need, in order to motivate yourself to get out of bed in the morning, you need to believe that you really have a shot at curing cancer. And so they put it in there, here's the benefits we're pursuing. <clears throat> Guidelines for selection of subjects. On the first day that the National Commission met, I was asked to review the papers that I'd been assigned to write. And I said, guidelines for the selection of subjects, that will not be a problem. 
All you have to do is to define the biological and social attributes that will enable you to test your hypothesis. Whew, was I wrong. This turned out to be my longest and most important paper. This is the paper that led me to correct Helsinki's vision of clinical research. And I l learned about five months ago that I introduced the term vulnerable into the language of ethics, bioethics. I learned this because a Dutch uh, historian named Hank Ten Hove phone, uh, called me and said, you know, you're the one that introduced vulnerable in the language of bioethics, and I want to know how it occurred to you to do this. I said, well, I didn't think I did that. He said, it's in your guidelines for selection of subjects. Well, I then went back and reread uh, that paper, and sure enough, there's the term. And then I read the paper I wrote right before that, the risk-benefit paper, and that's where I really introduced it. But I was careful to give credit to uh, John Rawls, uh, theory of justice, for introducing the concept of vulnerable or disadvantaged. In fact, in the risk-benefit paper, I used vulnerable or least advantaged as if it was a hyphenated expression. So I introduced the word vulnerable into the uh, literature of bioethics. Without knowing that, I have often said to students that if you read the literature of bioethics before 1975, you never see the word vulnerable. And if you read the literature of bioethics after 1978, it, you're hard pressed to find any paper that does not use the word vulnerable. But I didn't know I had anything to do with that. Informed consent. I didn't really have a lot to say about informed consent. That, I mean, this was the most discussed. In a paper I co-authored with Karen Labax, I said if you uh, read the literature of uh, ethics, you would think that 99% of it is informed consent and the rest of it is like nothing. And that was in a paper where we proposed to introduce other concepts. I did distinguish informed consent in practice from informed consent of research. And the main distinguishing criterion was that in medical practice, you could, with some confidence, delegate authority for most decision making to the healthcare professional. Alex mentioned that I was co author of the Belmont Report. I didn't know I was going to be co author of the Belmont Report. Uh, when Tom Beecham was uh, asked to develop a document identifying the basic ethical principles by the commission, I, was, uh, I sat next to Tom at the table, <clears throat> and uh, we talked about it quite a bit. And he decided then that we also ought to, ought to include a statement of what is research, what is practice, what is... Uh, non-validated practice, et cetera, and how do you parse that responsibility for reviewing these things? He said to me, and he said actually in several of his lectures, that when he was given all the materials produced by uh, consultants and staff, that he found that the materials he was given on ethical principles not usable. I mean, he got some ideas from them, but no language. But when he read the stuff I wrote on research and practice, he found it clear and harmonious with his own style of thinking. So he incorporated it bodily, and it became the first half of the Belmont Report. So that's how I became inadvertently co-author of the Belmont Report. <laughs> Somebody once said, I think it was Pierre Salinger when he was press secretary in the White House, never estimate the importance of a statement in advance. Tom and I thought this document that came to be known as the Belmont Report was a document written for the uh, benefit of the members of the commission and staff, just so they'd organize their discussions and thinking. Uh, it was discussed at length at a meeting at the Belmont Center in Maryland 
in February 1976. And that's how it got its name, the Belmont Report. When this thing was released, to use contemporary language, it went viral. It went all over the world. Within a couple of years, every guideline, every national regulation, everything referred to the Belmont Principles. This was stunning. We had no idea. And you know, at, at a couple of conferences, I've been introduced, as Alex did, as co-author of the Belmont Report. And three times now it's happened. Uh, somebody has walked up and said, oh, I've met God. <laughs> it was a little embarrassing. Uh, my paper on social and behavioral research demonstrated to the commission's satisfaction that these were inextricably overlapping and it would be a mistake to develop separate standards. My argument was intellectually correct, but a great policy error, and I wish I'd never written that paper. Uh, on the international scene, uh, my first introduction to international guidelines development was in 1975 when the World Health Organization invited me to participate in a discussion that was designed to develop criteria for guidelines. Not the guidelines, but criteria for guidelines. I'm given the credit, or if you will, the blame, for introducing the National Commission's principles into the international documents at a meeting I attended again at World Health in 1979. When I got there, I found that the group of people that had been uh, invited were split into two subsets, and one was called Law and Ethics, and I was to be the chair of the Law and Ethics session. And at the close of the first day, the man who was in charge of the conference said, Levine, I want you to write the uh, Belmont Principles for incorporation in this document. I said, no. These principles are very American. They don't belong in an international document. Well, the next morning I came to the meeting, and I found that he had written the principles in, but he got them wrong. So I corrected them, and I uh, faithfully restored the meaning that the National Commission had put out, and in this way uh, got uh, credit or blame for introducing the Belmont principles into international documents. I still think that they're <clears throat> very American, particularly the wording of uh, respect for persons, which is essentially equated with autonomy, which is not uh, a fundamental principle in about three quarters of the world. So, uh, but three quarter, that three quarters has put the principle in there national guidelines. In 1998, I was appointed chair of the, of the full name was the International Electronic Working Group for the revision, to propose the revision of the Declaration of Helsinki. Uh, I had members of this group from 55 countries, and we proposed a revision. I mailed it to uh, the <clears throat> CEO of uh, the World Medical Association, and with a cover letter. I had told the Ethics Committee that if I accepted this position, I was going to remove the distinction between clinical and non-clinical research. And in my cover letter, I said I did that, like I said I would. What happened then is they didn't circulate my cover letter with the guidelines with the proposed revision. And when the members of the Ethics Committee arrived in Santiago, the first time they ever saw the re proposed revision was that it was on their desk when they sat down at the meeting. Uh, there was chaos. People absolutely freaked out. They said, where's my Prince Article 1.3? I can't find it. Well, you can't find it when you remove the central organizing principle. A piece of it was on what the new thing called paragraph seven, and another piece was in the new paragraph 21, and so there was chaos. 
they decided that they were no longer going to discuss this document, and they took the discussion in-house. And <clears throat> I, uh, for a while, was persona non grata with the World Medical Association. Uh, by the year 2008, they adopted every proposed revision with one exception. One of the proposed new guidelines was on the justification of deception and research. And WMA insisted that doctors never deceive research subjects. I said, what about compliance? All the research you do on compliance with therapy, that much of that involves deception. Well, it's not recognized in, even to this day in the declaration. Uh, Now, the next uh, topic I want to take up is my relationship to SEAMS, uh, the Council for International Organizations of Medical Sciences, uh, which is usually referred to by its acronym, which is pronounced SEAMS. I first went to one of their meetings in 1978. <clears throat> it's what they called a regional roundtable conference. For SEAMS, a region was one quarter of the globe, and the meeting in Mexico City covered Central and South America and most of the islands that were nearby to those uh, places. The next one in Manila covered all of Asia, so I mean, we're talking big uh, regions. In Mexico, I was part of the crowd. I was fascinated by the proceedings, made a couple of mild comments, and when the Manila meeting came up, I got a letter from the Secretary General, a good friend of ours, of Alex's and mine, named Zbig Bankowski. Bankowski says, at this meeting we're going to have 21 papers presented. I want you to look at this list of 21 <clears throat> and pick two. I want you to present one major paper. Uh, on one of these titles, and a commentary on the other. In a mood of magnanimity, I wrote back, Dear Spig, I will uh, write a paper on any of the following 18. You pick. He wrote back and said, You've already written papers on those 18, and we can read them if we want to. I am going to assign you two of the other three. <laughs> <laughs> Clever fellow, that Bankowski. And uh, the major paper he uh, asked me to write is called The Validity of the Consent Procedures of the Declaration of Helsinki in Technologically Developing Countries. I was really upset. I didn't know anything about informed consent in technologically developing countries. And so what I did is I spent the summer <clears throat> reading anthropological studies of healthcare practices in various regions of the world. And the ones I included in the paper I wrote were a, uh, the Yoruba culture, not, not in the city, but in the countryside in Nigeria. I studied China, writings that were done during the Cultural Revolution. And I studied uh, a Mayan uh, village in uh, Mexico. And I uh, wrote a paper concluding that the uh, consent procedures in Helsinki had nothing whatever to do with consent in any of these parts of the world. I was pretty nervous about that, you know. Challenging Helsinki uh, was serious business. And so I sent this paper to, uh, again, a mutual friend of Alex's and mine, Renee Fox. Renee, I said, did I get this right? And she wrote back and said, you got it exactly right. And she offered a couple of changes, you know, to improve the flow of the language. But <clears throat> so I went to Manila. I flew on Korean Airlines Flight 007. Uh, about a year before it was shot down, uh, not knowing that I was uh, 
taking such an adventure. And uh, I found that I could upgrade to what they called executive class for $25. <laughs> and uh, I did that, which gave me a nice seat that swiveled and tilted. And uh, $25 each way it wasn't that big a bargain. And when I landed in Manila, I uh, found a note in my little pigeonhole mailbox from Bankowski. Your paper, which was scheduled for day three of the conference, is now to be the first paper presented on the first morning. So I looked for Bankowski and I said, what's going on? He says, well, your paper has occur caused a bit of a stir. <laughs> And we would like to have ample time to discuss it. So on day one, I presented this paper. And at the end of it, there was silence. And the chair of the uh, session, uh, who was one of the men who uh, signed, or who wrote the Tokyo revision of the Declaration of Helsinki, uh, said, I would like to hear some comment on this paper. <clears throat> And a man from uh, Indonesia stood up and said, he's right. He's absolutely right. Helsinki has nothing to do with us. And then a guy from Japan got up and said essentially the same thing. And the chair of the session said, you people were in Tokyo. You worked with us to develop the Tokyo revision and you never said a word. And the guy from Indonesia said, it's the first time we've seen somebody with a white face, show any signs that he would listen to us. Whoa, that was heavy. In 1990, uh, SEAMS then planned a revision of its uh, international ethical guidelines uh, to be published in 1993, and I was made co-chair of the steering committee. And the document we produced uh, had also the, the preamble so the SEAMS guideline says that its purpose is to provide advice for the correct interpretation of the Declaration of Helsinki, particularly as uh, research is carried out in technologically developing countries. Well, given my own experience with the interpretation of Helsinki, I had to urge that they consider differing standards. And so the 1993 document is full of circumlocutions. Here's one of my favorite. <clears throat> this is a direct quote from the uh, 1993 guidelines. The requirement of the Declaration of Helsinki that subjects must be healthy volunteers or patients for whom the experimental design is not related to the patient's illness is not to be disregarded lightly, but disregarded indeed. I mean, what this requires is if you want to do a study on the uh, role of catecholamines in the treatment in the pathogenesis of depression, it'd be okay if you did the study on normal volunteers or on people with rheumatoid arthritis, but not on the people whose pathogenesis you're trying to wonder. I mean, this is the sort of nonsense that was found throughout Helsinki. And another quote from those guidelines. Helsinki does not provide for controlled clinical trials. Rather, it assures the freedom of the physician to, quote, use a new diagnostic or therapeutic method if it offers the hope of saving life. There are customary and ethically justified exceptions to Helsinki. A placebo, for example. And uh, this is what I mean by the uh, way this document triangulates its way around the document that it was supposed to be uh, clarifying. In 2002 iteration of the, re the, la the most recent revision, I was chair of this steering committee, and the separation from Helsinki became complete. No more circumlocutions. I introduced in this a move away from idealistic and aspirational guidelines to much more pragmatic. The early documents in international ethics said what we really hoped would go on 
in a very good society, utopia, if you will. And people would look at these guidelines, we can't do that. And they would look through the rest of the document and pick and choose which ones do I also feel like following or not. But if you went to pragmatic guidelines and say, here is what we expect you to do today, you had a much better chance at compliance. Uh, <clears throat> and I think that was my main contribution to those guidelines. My attendance at primer meetings, as Joan will attest, began in the late 1970s. It was a Boston organization, and I came in as an out-of-towner uh, trying to find a place for myself in it. My big break came in the late 70s or early 80s when Judy Swayze, some of you will remember Judy, Judy was scheduled to be chair or moderator of the first plenary session. Judy was late. After about 10 minutes, they said, someone's got to chair this session. And they turned to me. And uh, that was my big break. It was like being discovered <laughs> sitting on, a, sitting on a, a stool at the right luncheonette in Hollywood. Uh, <laughs> And uh, after that, I was moderator of at least one plenary session for most of the uh, succeeding uh, primer meetings. And there were only uh, four plenary sessions at each of these meetings, so I had a big bite of the uh, program. I joined the board of directors in 1986. And, uh, the early days of the program committee were ever so much more simple than they are now. Joan and I would get on the telephone for an afternoon, and we would pick the program. We would pick the titles. We would pick the speakers. Uh, if we didn't have enough time, we'd uh, pick up the phone the next afternoon and finish the job. And that was that. Uh, we did pretty well, I think. You know. Now, uh, it's become very much more democratic, bureaucratic, and uh, I think perhaps they produce a better program. It's certainly a bigger program, but uh, sometimes I long for the good old days. There's an old saying, things aren't like they were in the good old days. <laughs> and the response to that is, and they never were. <laughs> uh, we all edit our biographies. Uh, I was vice president of Primer from 2007 to 2009, and then I got very ill in 2009 and announced that I was going to become an emeritus member of this board. By the time I recovered, Paula Knudsen had uh, nominated a new vice president, and so I was out of a job. Uh, but I did not become an emeritus member. When I received the Lifetime Achievement Award, I was really very honored and very thrilled, following in the footsteps of my good friend Jay Katz and my other good friend Charlie McCarthy. I was asked to name some people who would give talks at the ceremony where they presented me with this award, and I selected I was going to select two of my students, uh, students at Yale Medical School who had done their MD dissertation with me. But before I could get the word back to Joan, one of them phoned in and said, I want to give one of the talks. And some of you will remember Nancy Angloff. Nancy uh, was one of my great students. She worked for me as uh, associate chair of the IRB at Yale for nine years. And then she went to medical school. And now she's the associate dean in charge of educational affairs in the medical school. And a great, great favorite with the Yale medical students. And the other person, so I was left uh, with the uh, necessity to name one more speaker. And I picked my youngest graduate a uh, woman who at the time was an uh, intern, or I guess PGY-1, 
at Boston Children's Hospital, Rupali Gandhi, and she gave a beautiful talk. Now, Rupali was a special student. She had gone to Yale Law School before she came to medical school. When she arrived at Boston Children's, she was already quite expert in ethics, and they put her in charge of teaching ethics to the house staff as a PGY1. She also, uh, if you called Central Casting and said, I want a beautiful Indian princess, this was, I mean, she had a smile that would light up a room. And she still does. Have you seen her lately? Yeah, she's good. Anyway, uh, I can't say any, uh, quit talking about Primer without saying that uh, I was also a member of uh, uh, the IRB 101 team, where we pre presented what uh, was either introductory or moderately advanced uh, work to uh, people in the various, you know, the IRB 101 program. I worked very happily with uh, Susan Kornetsky, with, uh, there you are, with Ada Sue. I scared the life out of Ada Sue. One time we did a job together at CDC, and my plane was canceled, or I missed it, or, and I flew in at 545 the next morning. And you didn't know whether I was going to show up. <laughs> I also did a lot of work with Karen Hansen and some of the others in IRB. These were very pleasant days for me. Jay Katz, my good friend. Jay and I uh, were very good friends, but disagreed about so very many things. In fact, when Jay and I developed a course at Yale called Professional Responsibility, a required course for first-year medical students. In their student show, which uh, lampoons the fa faculty, they portrayed Jay and me grappling as wrestlers, rolling around on the floor, clawing at each other. Uh, but we thought it was a good idea to show them two faculty members arguing about issues to show that the issues we were talking about were arguable and that reasonable people could disagree. And we never once rolled around on the floor. <laughs> in the 1970s, I met Jay and uh, sat in on the classes he had designed for his MSL students. And within a few sessions, he asked me to teach one of them. And then he asked me to join him for lunch. And this began a tradition of ours to have lunch together once every couple of weeks for the rest of his life. It was a wonderful time. And we would argue and we would agree. Now, I want to tell a couple of little anecdotes about Jay. Uh, I mean, I could spend my whole time talking about Jay. And Jay was also a dear friend of Alex's. Uh, and I guess he was your mentor as a student. He was my mentor as a non-student. Jay would send me every paper he wrote and ask me to criticize it. And uh, I usually did. Uh, one paper he sent me, I received just as I was getting on an airplane to go somewhere. So I sent him a letter saying what was wrong with his analysis of the uh, UCLA schizophrenia placebo withdrawal case. Uh, he, when I got back, he said, you know, I really like your letter, and if you don't mind, I'm going to publish it as a footnote in my law review article. I said, Jay, I never heard of a letter being published as a footnote. Can I add it to my bibliography? You know, <laughs> he says, you can add it to whatever you like. And if you look in the St. Louis Law Journal in 1993, you will find my letter as a footnote to Jay's article. I tell this because of his devotion to presenting both sides, or both sides, sometimes multiple sides, of various arguments in which he participated. He was a true scholar. He was not a policy person. He sent me his dissent to the uh, report of the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments. Jay could have been known as the great dissenter Whatever organization he was a member of that was supposed to file a report, 
he almost always wrote a dissent to it. And on the uh, ACHRE uh, report, I picked up the phone and I said, Jay, I can disagree with you about something in every paragraph of this paper. And his response, and I quote, was, yeah, yeah, so what else is new? Just tell me if I made any errors. <laughs> and that's the way he uh, treated such things. I said I would, uh, oh, the paper, well, enough of that. My final slide, or my next to final slide, has to do with some of my contributions to pop culture. Many of the papers I wrote that were serious and that I thought were great insights into ethics, uh, almost nobody ever discussed them except at meetings like this one. But when I was on the Forrest Sawyer show, I forget if he was NBC, he was a partner with Maria Shriver on that morning program. He was talking to me about uh, transplants. And he said to me, why is there such a big fuss over heart transplants? Why not the kidney? I, well, the kidney, paired organ. You can take one out and still go on and live. All right, he says, what about the liver? I said, look. The big fuss over heart transplants has an awful lot to do with the emotional symbolism of the heart. He said, oh, what do you mean? I said, well, let me put it this way. Have you ever received a greeting card with a liver on it? <laughs> wow. I got back to New Haven, and the first thing, I, I went to lunch in the cafeteria, the faculty lounge, and the women behind the uh, counter were saying, Hey, have you gotten any cards with liver on them? <laughs> and you know, so this was the, uh, if you will, the talk of the town. I was on the McNeil Lehrer show, and Robert McNeil said to me, "Why is there all this fuss?" We, we were discussing the transplantation of was it a baboon's heart in uh, California? Why all this fuss over getting heart transplants for babies? I said, you know, why don't you just take regular heart transplant, add them to the list? I said, well, you see, a heart, uh, adult heart is too big to fit in the chest of a baby. He said, well, why don't you use baby's hearts? I said, well, let me explain to you uh, how we identify potential donors. They uh, die in circumstances where it appears that uh, we can transplant an organ. And uh, uh, we look at their driver's license, and it says organ donor. And then we ask them, the family. And he said, yes. Yeah. So what's the problem? I said, well, infants don't drive, have driver's licenses. Wow, big hit back in New Haven again. Hey, you've got your baby you're driving your car yet? <laughs> And uh, that's where I'm not going to even do. Well, on local TV, uh, I was being interviewed about informed consent. I said, a key thing we tell these people is that you may refuse to participate or withdraw at any time, and you will get your usual treatment. And the commentator says, you know what that sounds like to me? He said, you're telling me that if I refuse, I will get the usual treatment. I said, well, that's the same words, but that's not what I meant to say. <laughs> and uh, such things happen on TV, which is part of the reason that I gave television up. It's not my metier. Some of you have met my wife, Jerry. She wanted me to convey her greetings to you. This is Jerry dressed up for the Kentucky Derby, where we were told that uh, people were supposed to wear Kentucky Derby bonnets. And she made this bonnet, and they awarded her the prize for the best Derby bonnet. But anyway, she sends her greetings to you, and I thank you. Thank you.